Let's look for a second at the mutations, the types of mutations that can happen at the DNA level, which will then cause an altered RNA to be produced, which will then cause an altered protein to be produced. Let's take a peek. So, shown at the top here is normal DNA sequence for some theoretical gene. You'll notice a couple of things. Number one, that this, and by the way, this is very high yield information, and, and keep in mind that the mutations can occur in both DNA or RNA. The mutations can occur in either one. We're simply going to look at it from the point of view of DNA mutations. Now, what I want you to recognize is that the first triplet in a protein is always going to encode methionine. Let me back that up. The first triplet in the DNA or corresponding RNA is going to correspond to methionine. Methionine is always the first amino acid in a newly synthesized protein. Now, we're going to look over here at this leucine, at this leucine codon. Now, if the coding strand of DNA reads TTA, this will correspond to an RNA that at this particular point reads UUA. So that's going to be, for this example, it's going to be our normal codon sequence, UUA. The first mutation we're going to look at is called a silent mutation. So in this particular case, the A the TT, in the TTA triplet is going to be mutated to a G. So now, instead of reading TTA, this codon reads TTG. What does this correspond to in the messenger RNA? It's going to correspond to a UUG going to correspond to a UUG. Now, the UUG is also going to encode leucine. It's the same amino acid. So that's why we say that this mutation is silent. It's silent because you never know the mutation occurred. Shh, nobody has to know, right? Because the leucine is still going to be in the protein. Okay, so now remember that the third base is the one that got mutated here when the third base gets mutated, that's the most likely time you're going to get a silent mutation. It's because that third base provides less specificity for the protein that's encoded. The next example, the next example of mutation is the missense mutation. The missense mutation would happen when, say, this TTA got switched to a TCA, not the TCA cycle, it's going to correspond to a UCA. The UCA in the messenger RNA, when that is present in messenger RNA, the transfer RNA will bring in an amino acid, in this case, serine. Now, what should have been brought in? Leucine. What's going to be brought in now? Serine. Are those different amino acids? You bet they're different amino acids. Now, not only are they different amino acids, but the properties of the amino acids are different. Leucine, if you remember from your amino acids, is a hydrophobic amino acid. Serine is hydrophilic. So if serine is placed into the protein instead of leucine, you can bet that that might alter something with the protein function. Now, not all missense mutations are going to lead to a non-functional protein. Some missense mutations might put in an amino acid that's pretty similar to the one that was originally there, so you get a fully functional protein. But one thing is for sure, when there's a missense mutation, a different amino acid is incorporated into the protein. There's only one missense mutation that you need to memorize for the board exam, and you should memorize this. You don't need to memorize the base change, but you need to memorize the amino acid change. And it's, it's this right here. It's the sickle cell anemia change. In sickle cell anemia, you're going to see that a glutamate residue gets converted over to a valine residue. So it used to be an acidic amino acid present in this beta globin uh, protein, but now it's going to be substituted with valine, which is a neutral hydrophobic amino acid. It's a branch chain amino acid. So the alteration in the protein structure because of the substitution is going to cause the red blood cells to sickle. And you get vaso-occlusive crises, and you get uh, hemolysis that can occur in sickle cell patients, and it's obviously a very devastating disease. 
you need to know the sickle cell mutation that can happen. Moving on to nonsense mutations. Nonsense mutations happen when, say, the TTA that was initially present in the normal gene got mutated to a TGA. You realize that TGA corresponds to UGA in the messenger RNA? What happens when the ribosome sees a UGA? You go away, right? That's a stop codon. That's one of the three stop codons. So when the ribosome sees UGA, it's going to separate, it's going to release the protein, and in most cases what you'll end up with is a truncated protein when there's a nonsense mutation. It's truncated, meaning that the protein is shorter, shorter than it should be. Is it functional? Probably non-functional, but not 100%. That's a nonsense mutation. Last, we have the frame shift mutation. The frame shift mutation would happen when, say, what normally read as TTA over here, there was a base pair deletion. There was a base pair deletion, so perhaps one of the T's here was deleted. It happened by accident during DNA duplication, during replication. One of those DNA uh, polymerase enzymes, the repair mechanisms we spoke about, failed. And there was a deletion. Well, what happens when that occurs? What was normally a TTA that encoded a UUA at this particular codon, because a base was removed, everything's going to shift. And the ribosome, it's not that smart. It just goes along and looks for three bases, three bases, three bases. It doesn't know what the bases are supposed to be. It just looks for three bases. So it doesn't realize that this should have been UGA. It's now going to see what corresponds to TAC, which is a UAC. And then it's going to see a CUA and then a UAG. And it's going to start putting in the wrong amino acids. So tyrosine is going to be put in and leucine. And then lo and behold, look, UAG comes along. You are gone. So what's going to happen? The ribosome is going to hit a stop codon and go away. So when there is a frame shift mutation, the end result is the following. There's going to be downstream of the mutation, there's going to be incorrect amino acids incorporated into the protein. And then usually, usually what happens is you get premature truncation of protein synthesis. Because if you're out of frame, the chances are that you're probably going to hit a stop codon. And that's what you see. In frame shift mutations, usually you get incorrect amino acids downstream of the mutation and then early truncation of protein synthesis. In the example I just gave you, I talked about a one base pair deletion. What I want you to realize, though, is it could be a one base pair deletion or the addition of a base. And as a matter of fact, it could be the addition or deletion of one or two bases. Because addition of one or two bases is going to change the reading frame that the ribosome is looking for. What about an addition of three bases? Or what about a deletion of three bases? What's that going to do? Well, that's simply going to remove an amino acid. It's going to remove an amino acid or maybe add an amino acid. Now, depending upon where the bases get added or deleted, it may change a couple of amino acids. If it was, say, uh, three bases were introduced in the middle of a codon, that might change uh, two amino acids right around that codon. But all the other amino acids downstream are going to be the same. Same thing for if three bases got deleted. If, if this happened in the middle of a codon, well, then a couple of amino acids would be deleted but all the other amino acids downstream would be the exact same. So any multiple of three, if it gets added or deleted, it's not a frame shift mutation. It's going to just simply be insertion or deletion of amino acids. It might change a couple of amino acids, but you're not going to get um, permanent downstream changes of all the amino acids. Let's review once again, because this is so important, the different types of mutations and what you'd be expected to know what would happen as a result of these mutations. A classic question is to give you sort of a two-step question on the board exam, 
and show you a change that's occurred, the first thing you have to do is figure out what type of mutation it is. The second thing you have to do is predict what would happen as a result of that mutation. What's the ultimate effect on the protein? Because that's the bottom line. So if you had a silent mutation, remember, the new codon is simply going to specify the same amino acid. What's the effect on the protein? Shh, don't tell anybody. There's no effect on the protein. Nobody will know if you don't tell them, right? Okay. The missense mutation. The mis missense mutation, it's a new codon, and it's going to specify a different amino acid. A different amino acid. Now, the, the effects, it might be a decrease in function depending on the particular amino acid that gets put in. If it's an amino acid that's completely different than the one that was there initially, it's probably going to decrease the function. It might increase the function. Sometimes that happens, and that's how evolution occurs. Sometimes there's a mutation, and it might change the amino acid and change the protein in such a way that you increase the function and you provide a selective advantage. So it might be a decrease in function. It might be an increase in function. It's hard to predict. Usually, the diseases we see where there's mutations to a particular enzyme, for example, it's a missense mutation that decreases enzyme function, and that's why the patient gets the disease. All right. Next, we have nonsense mutation. In a nonsense mutation, the new codon specified is going to be a stop codon. So what are the three stop codons? You are gone, UAG. You go away, UGA. And you are away, UAA. So one of those three codons has been created. The protein, as we'd said, is usually shorter than normal because protein synthesis is stopped early now. And it's usually non-functional. Why is it non-functional? It's non-functional because a shortened protein is missing some of its sequence. And that's going to cause the folding to happen in a bizarre way that probably alters the function and makes it non-functional. And then lastly, we have the frame shift. Now, sometimes this is an in-frame. If there's th a multiple of three bases that's deleted or inserted, it's going to be an in-frame mutation. If there's one or two bases or a multiple of that inserted, it's going to be a frame shift mutation. As we would said, downstream of, the, of that frame shift, there's going to be incorrect amino acids inserted, so the protein's going to usually be non-functional, and the most common thing to happen is that a uh, premature stop codon is reached, and that's going to cause the ribosome to fall apart and for the protein synthesis to be truncated early. Some other types of mutations that you're going to be reviewing, and you'll be re reviewing some of these in medical genetics as well, are the following. There's large segmental deletions. Now, what this means is that during meiosis, there might be unequal crossover that happens during the homologous recombination step, in which your maternal and paternal homologous chromosomes exchange information. Sometimes, if this happens in an unequal way, there could be f portions of the gene that get lost, portions of the gene where there's insertions that happen, and this could cause a loss of function. You can even have shorter than normal or entirely missing genes. The best clinical example to think about this would be the alpha thalassemia. In alpha thalassemia, that's usually caused by one of these large segmental deletions where there's been unequal cro crossover that's occurred. The beta thalassemia is, is a little bit different. It may be more uh, down here where there's splice sites. So for large segmental deletions, I want you to remember alpha thalassemias. And for splicing site mutations, I want you to remember beta thalassemia. Actually, in addition to beta thalassemia, there's cases of Gaucher's disease that happen this way. There's cases of Tay-Sachs disease that happen this way. There's cases of lupus that can happen this way. So there's many disease types where there can be splice site mutations. Now, what happens in a splice site mutations? There's variable effects. Once again, there may be, depending upon where the mutation occurred, and you would have to see a map of this to predict where it would occur. You might see a few bases added, which will correspond to a few amino acids. 
you might see an entire axon removed. If, if, if both the splicing donor and acceptor site are mutated, you might have an entire axon removed. You might have an entire intron inserted into the, um, into the, the coding sequence so that probably in that case, you would get a non-functional protein produced. So the effects are extremely variable. You would have to see a map of where the mutations occurred to predict what they would look like. A board favorite down here, triplet repeat expansion. In triplet repeat expansion, what you have are areas of the coding sequence for the gene that as homologous recombination occurs and a, a, a haploid gamete gets produced, the number of repeats within that coding sequence is going to increase. Okay, now, this usually causes a protein product that's longer than normal. And if it gets too long, if there's too many repeats that get placed into the coding sequence, the protein's going to be unusable or it's going to be unstable. All right, usually it's, it's an unstable protein that's eventually going to get degraded. Um, Interestingly enough, diseases of triplet repeat expansion, they show this phenomenon called anticipation. Anticipation in their pedigrees. What does anticipation mean? What this means is, is as an individual with one of these trinucleotide repeat expansion diseases, as they pass the disease off to their offspring, that offspring is going to tend to get the disease at a much younger age, and they're going to tend to get the disease in a more severe fashion. So that's what anticipation means. It means that as the disease goes down a generation, the people that get the disease get it earlier, and they get it more severely. Some important examples for you to remember right here. <clears throat> Number one, Huntington's disease. Recall that Huntington's disease, you see an expansion of the CAG, trinucleotide repeat. And although you don't have to remember all the codons in the table, I think you should remember probably that CAG encodes glutamine. CAG encodes glutamine, so in individuals with Huntington's disease, there is an expansion of glutamine amino acids within the coding region of the gene, of the protein, I should say, Huntington. Now, Huntington's disease, you'll, you'll remember that that onsets in the third or fourth decade of life, maybe even the fifth decade of life. It's... Uh, Corioid uh, athetoid movements, it's going to be paranoia, confusion, and eventually it's collapse uh, of, of the CNS symptoms, and patients are going to be hospitalized and uh, unfortunately are going to probably aspirate and, um, and succumb to the disease. Now, Huntington's disease, in addition to some others, myotonic dystrophy, fragile X syndrome, Friedrich's ataxia, okay, all of these diseases are ones you should recognize on test day as being caused by triplet repeat expansion. Remember these, it's gonna help you out, I promise.